Swim check one, two. Bike check one, two. Run check one, two. I think we're ready. Let's try this. Welcome to the Try Beginner's Luck podcast, a podcast where we explore the sport of triathlon from a variety of perspectives to help beginner triathletes on their journey. I am your host, Mashonda Shines. It's a new day. It's a new edition of Try Beginner's Luck. Welcome back. Yes. Today, if there was any day where we needed to be official, it is today. If there was any day that we needed to know the rules, it's today. If you've ever gotten a five or 10 second penalty or 30 second penalty or a blue little slip, today is a day to find out why you shouldn't get those ever again because we are going to unveil all of the rules. I mean, maybe not all of them, but we're gonna discuss some new rules that have come out that will affect the way that we race in 2023. And I have just the guy for you. He is the commissioner of officials. That's such an official title. You see this alliteration on officials. (laughs) Oh, I'm cracking myself up. So yes, we have the commissioner of officials with us today, Mr. Mark Turner. He is not only an official, but he's also a coach. And prior to becoming into the multi-sport world, he served as USAG official director of competitions and communication for the South Texas Amateur Golf Association, as well as coaching boys lacrosse in Texas and Louisiana. He's a Southern boy. Oh, yes, he is. Mark also holds a USAT level two endurance and paratriathlon coach, as well as an Ironman University coach. Listen, without further ado, I get to bring to you the man who is over all the officials with USA sanctioned, USA triathlon sanctioned races to you so that we can find out how not to get penalties in 2023 and beyond. Mark, Welcome to Try Beginner's Luck. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mishonda. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I'm so excited uh, to talk about the rules. You know, I say oftentimes I want to bring people on in every aspect of the sport because I don't think it's just right for us to learn from one particular group versus the other. And this sport is just so... um, rich with so many different perspectives and so many different layers that we have to uncover them all. I feel like, and this is weird, and it could just be because I'm hungry. Triathlon and all the categories that are involved, it's like a bean dip, where it's just layers upon layers of goodness that we just have to unveil or unveil. So let's get right into it. Mark, you're not only a coach, you're not only the official of officials (laughs) or the commissioner of officials, which is the official of officials, but you've also raced a bit. And I can't have you not come on here and talk about your race experience. So let's get involved to how did you even come to learn about triathlon and tell us about your story? Sure. Well, um, it's, it's, it started a long time ago, really. Um, my wife and I were part of a running club, Roadrunners of America, up in Northwest Houston, where we were living at the time. And this was back in the late 80s, uh, so about 10 years after our sport had been invented. And um, I'd never heard of it. Um, very few people really uh, uh, had heard of it at that point, you know, that were involved in any kind of sports. And But because we were part of a running club and they needed some volunteers for a race that was going to actually take place down where we actually still live right now uh it's where my wife grew up and we thought oh this will be great we'll go down and volunteer for this thing we don't know what it is but we'll go down and we'll volunteer for it and um and you know see the family that's down in the you know the south side of houston down next to clear lake uh it's real close to to nasa and the parking lot where the transition took place for this race actually still exists next to this very infamous hilton on clear lake um and so um we, we were assigned to work in transition. I uh, didn't know what transition was. 
Um, everybody was riding a 10 speed Schwinn and most of the men were wearing speedos and, and, uh, you know, it was, it, it was the late eighties. Right. And just watching it, uh, I fell in love with it. I was like, this is something I gotta do. I, I gotta, I got, I had, I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps and my dad had given me a 10 speed that he'd won in a raffle. And I brought it back with me from California to, to North Carolina where we were living and eventually here to Texas. And, uh, and, and I started training for that first triathlon. Um, and unfortunately I didn't make to the starting line for that first triathlon. So I, I trained for about a year. And, uh, as I got close, we, we went through the winter. I picked up a little case of, um, mild pneumonia, but I was having trouble breathing and keeping my oxygen levels up. So I was in the ICU for four days and I, they, everybody kept referring to me as the triathlete in ICU. Um, unfortunately I was also misdiagnosed and I spent the next 20 some years, uh, treating a condition that I didn't have. Uh, and, and it took me a while to find out what I did have, which was, it turned out was just asthma and it was highly treatable, but it had gone untreated. And so finally I, I kind of said, okay, I gotta, I gotta get control of this. I was sick all the time. And so I said, I, I gotta do something about it. And I went to an immunologist and he, he's the one who said, you know, it's almost certain you have asthma. We'll give you a test here. And they, they did. And, but then I was in pretty bad shape. So they, it took a while to get my meds under control. And once they, once we did, I kind of started setting some goals because I kept on following triathlon uh, all that time, especially Ironman, you know, it's because it's iconic. It's on the news and, and it was a growing sport um, at the time. And uh, so I st started, I uh, started running. Uh, Christmas Eve, 2007, I ran my first half marathon in April of, uh, 2008. Um, and I was able to do my first multi-sport event in 2011, I think it was. Um, and I did my first triathlon in 2012, which was kind of, uh, interesting because it was over in, uh, Louisiana and, uh, there was going to be a lake in Louisiana. You know, you have a mental image, Michonne, of a lake in Louisiana, right? And mm -hmm. and so we, and, and then they, I, I wanted to make sure they were capping it at 300 people. Uh, and I wanted to make sure I got into this thing. So I, I got, I was waiting for the registration to open and I, I jumped on and I, I got registered. It was the Magnolia uh, tri Super Sprint Triathlon. And uh, we show up on race morning. And that's when you did pack a pickup at this race. And the way they had decided to do the race numbers was in the order that you had signed up. And that would also be the order that you would go into the water in a, in a time trial start. And uh, I went up to get my swim cap and they wrote number one on it. <laughs> and, and it was February in, uh, in Louisiana, which even in Louisiana, February can be kind of chilly. And this lake was owned by this fairly wealthy family and it was designed for water skiing for their kids and they dumped limestone in it all throughout the year to keep it clear so it was like blue water and uh but it was about 62 degrees i think it was so i had my sleeveless wetsuit that i had bought and i'd never worn in a triathlon before and i you know and i knew i was lined up with uh, 299 of my new best friends who were almost certainly going to swim over me and I hit the water, my face went in and it never came back out. And, uh, I swam to the, it was a point to point from one side of the lake to the other. And so I'm, I, I'm so dizzy when I get out that it's like that game you play with the baseball bat where you go spin around, spin around. So I was so dizzy and I'm trying to make my way to transition. And, uh, the inter interesting thing about it was that, you know, it was, it was, it was in Louisiana and, um, and, and they had said that there would be, there would be, um, strippers at the, um, when you get out of the water and, and I didn't recognize that they meant people to help with the wetsuit. I just thought, wow, this is really interesting, <laughs> but I, 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 so I didn't, I didn't get any assistance and get my wetsuit off, but I did make my way to transition. And in those days I was running in, uh, Vibram five fingers. And my feet were so cold that it took me about halfway through the 5K before I realized I had two toes in each slot and no toes in some of them. Um, but I made it through my first event, and uh, and it and I never looked back after that. <laughs> Such a full story, Mark. I mean, it's like you took us from high to low, <laughs> back up to high again. So much in there, and. I guess I'm just really, um, I'm grateful you were able to get the diagnosis right. I think sometimes 
mistakes happen and they're unfortunate. And in this case, it was unfortunate because something as easy as asthma was given to you as something very different. So just imagine the medications you were taking. And I know you said it took them so long to get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, that messed up a couple of years of, of activity for you. Oh yeah. There was a time when, you know, I couldn't, my, you know, I had a young son, uh, four or five years old and, you know, I couldn't run to keep up with him. Uh, I'd get out of breath. I was on quadruple doses of prednisone from time to time, uh, which exacerbated the, the, the weight gain from the lack of exercise and activity. Um, but you know, I, the thing I would always say to, I've, I've learned from that is I tell people, whatever opinion you get, if it's, if it's potentially life altering, get a second opinion, uh, ask somebody else. So that's important. And that's good to know, like never take a, a, a diagnosis for face value. Um, so that's just a word to the wise, just go ahead and get a second opinion. Um, but you also mentioned <laughs> when you, at first, when you said that you put your face in and never came back out, I was like, but how are you here today? But I get what you're saying now. <laughs> so I was like, I swam like this. So I can hope I know your listeners can't see it, but you know, you can figure it out. My face was out of that water and I was just swimming this way the whole time. And smoke because I slung my head from side to side That's with that. every stroke. I was just dizzy. I'm luckily I got to the other side of the, the lake. That is hilarious to me. And then putting your, 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 the, the five, what is it? The Vitabrum? The Vibram uh, five fingers, Vibram the ones that fingers. where your toes go in the little slots. Yep. You were brave to put those <laughs> shoes on after swimming and biking. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, so we, you know, you survived your first race, even though it yep. was a delayed uh, <laughs> first race for a couple of years, but you didn't give up. And I think, um, there's somebody who's listening who's probably experienced something similar where they were given a diagnosis or wanted to tell a start, starting line and they didn't get there and ha have had to wait. And so a delay is not a denial. And so I just want to encourage you, whoever is listening who's had that experience, you know, don't keep, don't give up, keep going back at it and keep trying, but most importantly, work on you because this is all about overcoming your own obstacles in order to get the victory that you deserve. All right, so we've raced our first race. You've gone on to do races from sprint to Ironman. You've done it all in between. And I know we'll probably talk about some of your experience as we talk about some of the rules, but we have so many rules we should probably talk about that we'll, you know, we'll kind of infuse it in. But how did you come to officiating <laughs> races? Because well, like, <laughs> that's a whole different first step yeah so uh when my wife and i were first married um uh i come from a family that has a little bit of history in golf uh, my, my great uncle was a golf pro in kentucky and uh so i'd always been interested in it i didn't play in high school i played lacrosse in high school but um you know we didn't have kids we, we had a lot of time we had a couple of dogs but you know um we we took up the game of golf and uh, I've just been wired this way, I guess, from from go. And so, uh, you know, if I'm going to play a sport, I want to know what the rules are. And so I began reading on the rules for golf. And then that got me interested, you know, because when, when you take up golf that late in life, unless you're just a supernatural athlete, which I am not, um, you're, you're probably not going to be that great at, at the game, but you could play it the right way. And so I, uh, I started reading on the rules of golf. I got really interested and I contacted my regional association to, to see about, you know, what it took to become a, a, a golf rules official. I was interested and they put me in touch with the regional association. It just ha so happened at that time that the, the regional association here in Texas was beginning to grow and really promote very good amateur golf. And in other words, these are very good, you know, golfers. They're not bogey golfers playing on the weekend. They're, they're really good, but they're still amateurs. And so um, I, I got, I became a golf rules official. And then I found out, you know, that when you become a golf rules official, you know what you don't do a lot of? Play golf <laughs> because you're busy working all the time. And, you know, and so when I was started getting back in shape, I was doing all running. So my wife, because I'm an age grouper, uh, she could hand me stuff, you know, like extra water bottles from the, you know, the, the, the mix of hydration that I prefer that I'd made for myself. But when I started doing multi-sport, you, you can't receive outside assistance. 
and uh, unauthorized assistance is not allowed. So she would go to the race with me and she'd just kind of stand around and, uh, you know, chat with people. And we met a rules official uh, at one of the races and we began talking to him. And I was like, yeah, this is the one thing. This is not happening. Uh, I'm not becoming an official uh, in this sport because I know what happened the last time. And so, uh, but, but, my wife Lee, she began talking to uh, to Todd, and they and talking about we need more officials in the sport of triathlon. We really could use more. So, next thing I know, um, we're in Pensacola, Florida, for her to do a officials clinic, and it's about oh, I guess it was a month or so before I was going to do my first seventy point three with Ironman in Austin. So I was just along for the ride and um, watching. And yeah, interestingly enough, of course, you know, when I got out, right before I got out of the Marine Corps, a buddy had taught me how to ride a, his motorcycle. And I was like, hey, this would be cool. Get a motorcycle. Apparently, this was not cool with the Mrs. to be. And uh, so I never got a motorcycle. And uh, so then on race morning for the clinic, for the new officials, I'm standing there next to the transition while my wife gets on a motorcycle with a random stranger <laughs> to ride on the back and be an official. And I'm like, so I couldn't have a motorcycle, but you get on the back of one with somebody you don't even know. And uh, so off she went. And I was, once again, I was very like, I I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I want to race. I don't want to be an official. And uh, so after I got my first coaching uh, certification, it was, I thought it would be to my benefit to at least go through the clinic and, and, and learn the rules. And that led to one thing after another. Luckily for both of us, we met uh, a really, really important mentor uh, for for that first race that I worked. Lee worked one over in Florida as her first, but her second and third were worked here in the Houston area at a triathlon that used to be used to go called the Kima Triathlon. It was a qualifier for Al Alcatraz in those days. And uh, the next year came around. I, I raced that year. But the next year came around and, and we had met uh, who would turn out to be a very important mentor for both of us, a man named Ed Cheatham. He was a 20 year USA triathlon official. And uh, that last 10 years of his time as a triathlon official, he was the North American head referee for Ironman. And he just took us under his wing and taught us the ropes of how to be an official. And, you know, it's like I've talked with our CEO, uh, Vic, you know, the rules are about 5% of what it takes to be a good official. The rest is 95%. And that's that's the, about how you carry yourself, how you how you interact with you with the athletes and race directors and spectators at an event. Um, your 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 demeanor and your ability to be calm under pressure. It's a quality called equanimity. Um, and if you have that, you'll be a good official. If you can maintain your calm when somebody's very very upset with you. <laughs> And you don't escalate, and you learn how to de-escalate those situations. Um, you'll be a good official. But it's it's a that's kind of how I got my start. It went from golf, officiating. I swore I would never be a multi-sport official, and now, unfortunately, look where I am. <laughs> it's so interesting. The things that we say that we're not going to do <laughs> are the things yeah. that we're the best at. And uh, it's so I love hearing your story. Because it just goes to show you that anything literally is available to us if we just get out of our own way. And you getting out of your own way and just saying, hmm, well, I'm a coach. I just need to learn the rules. It, it could be helpful. Now you are the commissioner of the rules, of all the rules <laughs> that gets people penalties. So yes, equanimity. <laughs> Who knew that was a word? <laughs> I can see that, how that is important. Although I can see how that's important for you guys to have to remain calm because I've seen some situations where athletes get very, very angry, especially when well, it comes to penalties that cause them to be overall winners or podium or, you know, the top of their age group for that particular race. So I can see why that is so important. Wow. Yeah, I, that, that was one of the things that at that very first race. Um, so what Ed had told the athletes at the athlete briefing, that was, they held an athlete briefing the day before the race. Mm -hmm. And anyone who attended that athlete briefing would have heard what he had to say, which is it's an out and back Olympic distance course. And we know that tomorrow we're predicted to have very strong headwinds on one of the directions. 
Mm -hmm. So we know it, you may struggle to complete the pass in the allotted amount of time. So here's the thing we want to tell you. We're going to, we're going to watch. We're going to give you leeway. We're going to give you more time. We're going to understand that you may be struggling once you attempt that pass, but you have to keep going. You can't go in and back out. You have to complete the pass. And we'll, and we'll watch. And if you're just still struggling to make that progress, we're going to give you the more time. And, I, and he told all the athletes that, but don't back out. And so, unfortunately, some people didn't go to the athlete briefing. And so mm -hmm. there were two gentlemen that, that uh, got penalties. And the way that USA Triathlon did penalties at that time, right, was that after the race was over, the penalty time was added to your time. And so when they saw that the time had been added, it moved them off of the podium and out of the money. And they were not very happy. And they were just very aggressively arguing with with uh ed and really just you know and and ed, he just stayed so calm under under that pressure um and it really it had highlighted to me how important that was and what was really great about it is when when it, when you approach it that way as an official uh this is usually the result um, you usually get a communication from that athlete a week or so later saying hey you know i've thought about this a lot more I realized you were just doing your job. It was really, a, I was the one that was at fault in this situation. I apologize and I just want to you know, let you know that I, I do respect what you're doing out there. And that's why it's so important that we not be part of the part of the issue, part of the argument. We're just there to listen. And that was the, the words that Ed gave me at that first race. When you're dealing with an athlete who has been penalized and wants to inquire about it, the first thing you should do is say, tell me what happened. And then listen and listen fully. That's good. I, I, um, if you're listening to this, this is a shout out for race directors who pride themselves on doing athletes briefings. It's important. Go to the briefings because anything can change the day before the race. Anything can change actually even at the race, because they give another like pre-briefing before the race starts. And so it's important that you do what you can do to even mitigate the issues, uh, because it's just about knowing the information and knowing it so that you don't, one, cause an incident, cause an accident, and it's for your information so that you can know um, the course and all of the tricky areas, i.e. like the headwinds for that particular race, so that you you know what to do and how to maneuver through it. Um, but it's interesting that you say remain calm because as an announcer, I can sometimes hear and see situations, uh, especially when it's coming down to awards time of challenges that may be arising, right? And sometimes athletes don't even like it when people are calm because they think that it's a way of being demeaning to them, that they are patronizing them if they're being calm and just being like, Okay. All right. Have you ever had experiences with that where, you know, athletes probably your calmness armed them versus disarmed them? Yeah, I've never really experienced that, but I can see where that could be possible. Um, I think you, you I think what the the reality is though is there's two different kinds of, of calm, right, in those situations. Mm -hmm. There's the insincere Right. Where I'm putting on a show of being calm and being disengaged is really what it comes across as. But what I'm talking about is being engaged and being very being clear that you're actively listening to what the athlete or and in some cases, the athlete's family or friends or coach are saying uh, so that you, you you don't appear disengaged. Um, and so that and that's an important part of that. It's it's not to to say I'm I'm emotionally detached from this. No, I want to be emotionally engaged, right? I want to have empathy for this for this athlete. I want to care about what their concerns are. Um, that's part of our you know our customer service standards that USA Triathlon has developed, and which we have our our officials go through uh, customer service training. And uh, we always talk about, you know, this emphasis on customer service. And sometimes people will say, well, then that means you're not going to enforce the rules. Well, that's not true. Um, we, we, the athletes want us to enforce the competition rules. Uh, they want the race to be fair. 
Uh, they want it to be safe and they want us to help as much as possible in making that happen. Uh, the example I always use is that when I was six years old, my I, I lived living with my aunt and her son was, uh, I think, maybe nine or 10 at the time. So uh, like almost twice my age at that point in life. Right. And uh, he loved playing Monopoly and he loved playing Monopoly with me. The reason he loved playing Monopoly with me is he always changed the rules. So he always won. So it wasn't any fun for me because the rules were always flexible to to make him uh, be the winner. Uh, and I think that's kind of the, the same thing. Right. The The athletes want the rules to be fair. And they want them to be applied fairly. Uh, and so they do want the rules um, uh, enforced. Um, but we we as officials need to think about where we are in the race. Um, are we up in the front with a bunch of uh, young age groupers uh, that are really, really right on the edge and they really are drawing our attention? One of the, the things that, uh, Michonne, that we had in, uh, in golf that I've shared at a number of briefings, we had this saying about officiating um, and what the recommendation is to the athlete is avoid the appearance of evil because that's what attracts attention right so if you're if you're right on the edge you're going to attract people's attention uh whether, whatever it is you know so if i when i was a sure. golf official if i was in my golf cart on the other side of the fairway and i saw a player walk up and start putting their hand down around in the grass poking around i'm going to go look to see what they're doing you know because i don't know what they're doing so they have not avoided the appearance of evil in that case right they've made me think hmm something might be going on over there well you know if i look up ahead and i see uh three athletes all wearing the same kit that doesn't mean we don't want teams to participate but if they're all wearing the same kit and we seem to see them moving all in unison they're probably going to attract our attention uh if someone's really close to the edge in a, of a draft zone uh we're going to look at them more more closely um and then than other athletes and so you know you look at a race with uh, anywhere from 200 to 2000 people uh, the ones that are riding on the edge stand out and that's why they attract attention so if you're riding in an appropriate distance and you're passing when you're supposed to pass and you're 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 doing all the things that you're supposed to do you're going to attract very little attention because there's there's enough other people doing things that attract our attention interesting Okay, so rules. What we were just talking about perhaps was drafting. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a, a big, uh, one of your probably biggest penalties that you have to give is around drafting and passing. And so mm -hmm. I do believe um, that's probably one of the eight most commonly violated USAT rules. Would you say yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and it stems out of a misunderstanding that okay. triathletes have. And Let's talk about what, it. Yeah. So uh, when I talk to triathletes around uh, the country uh, at small races, big races, in written communications, mm -hmm. triathletes are under the mistaken, not all, but many, are under the mistaken impression that during the bike portion of a triathlon or a other multi-sport event, that it is their individual right to go as fast or as slow as they are individually capable of going. In other words, if I can go 25 miles an hour, it's my right to go 25 throughout the whole bike portion of the race. Hmm. And it's not? And No, it's not. That's a bicycle race. In the bike portion of a triathlon, your speed is dictated by two things. The position you put yourself in or the position someone puts you in. In other words, when you enter the draft zone of the cyclist in front of you, you may have to go faster than you would prefer to go in order to complete the pass in the allotted amount of time. If someone puts you in their draft zone, right, you have yielded the right of way. So when you're up in front, you have right of way. You can go as fast or as slow as you want to go. You can sit up, drink, eat, go, go back down, go fast. Like I say, you can go fast and slow as you want because you're in the front. You have right of way. Mm -hmm. But once you yield right of way, when the plane of the bicycle of the cyclist passing you breaks the plane of the front wheel of your bicycle, you must immediately begin making rearward progress all the way out of the draft zone before attempting to repass. In other words, you have to slow down. You may not want to, but you have to because you can't repass before you get back to the appropriate number of bike lengths of clear space. And so athletes and, – and so the other thing we say is – an athlete should never attempt to complete a pass unless they're highly confident of their ability to complete the pass in the allotted amount of time. 
Because once you go into the draft zone, there's only one exit, and that's out the front. You have to complete the pass. Entering the draft zone and then backing out is drafting by definition in our rules. And so, like I say, athletes become confused. They think, well, you know, that person, and here's what happens. And this is a very common situation. Uh, <laughs> my first triathlon, it happened to me, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm riding along. You're riding along, right? And athlete 167 passes you and then moves back over in front, right, as they should. They, they move left. They make the pass. They move back to the right. They're in front of you. And then they slow down. And so you have to slow down even further because they've slowed down. I wonder why they're slowing down. The reason they're slowing down is typically they don't know what they're doing, right? They've probably been drafting off of you. You've been head down looking at your front wheel, maybe looking up, and you've been going, and all of a sudden this athlete passes you, moves over. Now you have to slow way down because you've got to jack all the way out of the draft zone, right? So you, you move all the way out of the draft zone. And then as an age grouper, you legally move all the way back up into the draft zone on this athlete that has slowed down and you move left, complete the pass, move right. Oh, about three minutes later, guess what happens? <laughs> they pass you again and they mm -hmm. slow down because the only reason they're able to go as fast as they were is because they were drafting off of you, right? And so they've rested a little because they've gained about 20% right uh, of efficiency by being closer to you and drafting off you but then they get up at the front they can't maintain that speed because they're not that fast mm -hmm. so what i always tell people is when you find yourself in that situation this is kind of a rules official coaching kind of thing right when you find yourself in that situation it's don't let it keep happening all day <laughs> because when you make the pass the next time just drop the hammer a little bit longer they won't be able to get on your wheel and you'll leave them behind and you can have your own you can have your own race the rest of the day on the bike course but but you can't simply say that well they keep passing me and slowing down because invariably what's going to happen if you repass before dropping out of the draft zone that's when an official is going to show up and they're not going to know the whole history of the narrative that has been taking place between you the story of strife between you and the athlete that keeps passing you and then slowing down they're just going to see that you entered the draft zone or that you were put in the draft zone by the cyclists. They passed you and then you immediately repassed. That's all they're going to see. They don't, they don't know that whole story. They can't know that whole story. And so you're, you're subject to the penalty uh, for drafting. Interesting. And so that is one of the most um, challenging parts of racing because of what you just mentioned right there. Especially mm -hmm. for, um, I was talking with a friend and she was saying how, because we were just trying to really conceptualize sometimes how races will have, you know, one race day for one group and another race day for another group and why that matters. And it's because like some women can hang with male riders, but oftentimes get caught up in what you just described mm -hmm. because they know how to block and control their speed. And so it gives them an unfair advantage. Yeah. And so if they're observed blocking, they should be given a blocking uh, foul. You're not allowed to block. You're not allowed to impede the progress of another athlete. Well, you know, let's just be real, Mark. Officials not always around all the time. Nope. Nope. And so nope. <laughs> there's a lot of shady stuff that be happening out on the course. Yep. And you so know. one of the things, whenever I'm giving a briefing, whether it's professional athletes or age group athletes, mm -hmm. I always tell them the one thing. And the one thing is this. There's only one group of people that can prevent uh, position fouls, penalties, drafting, blocking, any breaking of the rules. There's only one group of people that can prevent that, and that's the athletes, mm -hmm. uh, the athletes themselves. And so it is a, both a in, – in most cases, it is both a moral and strategic decision that an athlete is faced with. So if there's a group up in front of you and you're riding up and you're looking at them and you're saying, hmm, I'm not sure – I'm not 100% sure I can get through that group. See, that's strategy, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I have the ability, the, 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 the physical ability to, to make it through that group. Morally, should I enter that group? It, it, you know, my contributing to the problem by entering the group, because the, the more athletes that don't do that, that don't go into the group and make the group bigger, the easier it is for officials to do their job when they do get there. 
because it's it they can they're 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 going to look they're finding the most you know egregious violators. And the other way to, that's important is how we officiate any kind of group, because a group being a group doesn't mean that everybody's drafting or blocking or breaking any rules. They could all be. It's a dynamic thing. It's a living organism, if you will. Right. Some people are riding and there may be a few people in there that did make that bad decision. Right. And they got in there and now they can't get out. And so what we want to do as officials is we want to go to the number two spot in that group. In other words, the second rider. And we, we want to have our motorcycle driver slow down to that same speed, okay? So if the group's going 25, they're going the same, approximately the same speed or they wouldn't be a group, right? So let's just use the number 25. Number one is has right away. They're up in front. We're going to give number two the benefit of the doubt when we get there because when we get there, even though we may have a very strong feeling that they may have been riding and drafting off number one for a while when we get there, we we, we didn't see that. So we can't just assume we know what 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 was happening even though we may have a very from our experience have a very strong uh, opinion about this so we say we ask the motor driver go 25 well, let's observe and see what two does two at that point has the option of backing out or making a pass in other words we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they haven't just been passed and so then they would be able to back out or that they're making the pass and they're completing the pass we give them the benefit of the doubt and so we watch what that athlete does. If that athlete alters their behavior, then we say to the moto driver, please slow down to one mile an hour slower than the group. And we make the group go by us so that we observe their behavior. And when we get all the way to the back or the back gets to us, if you will, then we go back to the front, to the new number two. We start it all over again. Typically, if we do that three times or so, with any group that has formed, what happens is the athletes who are actually fast get out the front. They get away. They're not being drafted off anymore. The athletes that could only stay in that group because they were drafting get spit out the back, and they they start spreading out. And then the one or two souls that <laughs> made a bad decision and got in there, they said, oh, man, now I just get to have my race again. Thank you for being here, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, I'm not going to do that anymore the rest of the day. You know, because it, it can be very frustrating if you get into a group and there's no way out. And once people start riding two and three across as a group, jockeying for position, it that's when we have the problems. And yeah. so that's why it's so important for an age group athlete to ride right and only move left unless they're completing a pass. And you want to think about it. This is, once again, this is kind of a rules in coaching. And what you want to do to make sure you're doing this safely is observe the behavior of the athlete in front of you that you're thinking about passing. If they're weaving all over the road, don't go too close. If they're really down good and hard and they're just they're holding their line, then you can go all the way up and then move left. And then you have you gain that draft advantage when you're going slightly anaerobic in order to complete that pass even easier. But we tell people if you're going one mile an hour faster than the athlete you're trying to pass, you're going to pass them well within the allotted amount of time, no matter what the, the draft zone distance is. Yeah. Whatever that time is for that, you'll you'll pass well within it if you're going one mile an hour faster. Now, the other person you want to look for is the one in the million dollar kit that maybe was a slow swimmer or in a different wave than you. And they're sitting up and they're drinking from their Gatorade and they're riding on a $12,000 QR or something like that. And they're, you're getting ready to start to pass them and they're just going to get done with their Gatorade and they're going to drop the hammer when you get about a bike length from them and you're never going to pass them in the allotted amount of time because they're going, they were just taking a break. So you want to watch the behavior and observe what the athlete looks like. Um, in terms of their perceived ability before you enter that draft zone, just make, so you make an educated decision. That's good. I, especially when you kind of say the athletes that may not be as strong swimmers, but they are amazing cyclists. I see it all the time. You know, <laughs> those cyclists come past you and you're like, wait, 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 where did you even come from? Yep. And they're just good, you know, cyclists, whereas you might be a stronger swimmer. And vice versa. Okay, so let's talk about some of the rules that are commonly broken. Like, let's talk about some of those. Um, yeah, I just I had one recently yeah. with uh, Colleen mm -hmm. Quigley, um, where she was talking about how she put her helmet on, well, didn't put her helmet and chin strap on before getting on the bike. Mm -hmm. So many people make that mistake. Sure. Uh, what are some other ones that you see uh, that we can just kind of go through? Uh, talking about those so that people won't make these most commonly uh, mistakes. Let me, 
Well, one of the things I always say to people is let's pull up the commonly violated and just go through them. <laughs> let's see. Let me find my. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the eight commonly most violated. Uh... Yeah, I'd say these are, and we always say eight commonly, this document that we have is eight commonly violated USAT rules, uh, and there are other rules that are violated, Um, but helmets and chin straps, you know, getting on the bike before you've buckled the chin strap or put the helmet on, probably one of the biggest ones on the run, especially is unauthorized assistance, getting assistance from others, uh, people other than race staff or officials. Um, it's, It's usually very innocent. Um, and that's why we really want to make sure we're proactively warning an athlete and a, a spectator, usually a family member that's trying to hand them something. Um, and it's just, it's not within the rules. Um, the position, people riding left, it is very, very common, uh, probably one of the most common uh, and probably one. Of, and one of the things that leads to the issue you were talking about before, Mishanda, of groups forming, which mm-hmm. is that athletes move left way before. I mean, age group athletes, right? They move left way before they get to inside the draft zone. And it's because they, they don't want to be seen like they're drafting. They think of drafting as being covered up by the other athlete. And so they'll, you know, if it's, let's say it's a, a six bike length distance, they'll move over at eight, right? Mm. And so they're struggling because right now they violated the position rule. They're, if they stay over there too long, if they're riding left when there's room to ride right, they're out of position. Right. And so what we want to do very early in the race as officials is get up there to when those athletes are doing that and say, athlete 167, move right unless you're actively passing. And then they're usually it's because they don't know what they're doing and they go, oh, well, and then they never move left again until they're completing a pass the rest of the day. Um, entire course. Uh, and it's not so much that people are intentionally course cutting, but they haven't understood the course, whether it's the bike course, the swim course, the run course, and they don't complete the entire course. And it's really, really important that an athlete completes the entire course, including the segment order. We've had athletes in the past say, well, there there were segments. There was an out and back there and an out and back here, but I went to the second segment first, and then I did the first segment segment, but ultimately I did the full distance, but you know, it's still a potential unfair uh, competitive advantage. Up uh, And then uh, as our sport grows, this is one we will continue to to deal with, which is uh, headphones and communication devices. Um, we see this very often at duathlons, and the reason for that is the athletes have shown up. They're not swimmers. They're they're usually they're runners, right? And so they, they show up and they don't hear us all throughout the morning telling them they can't have headphones and a personal audio device. And there's a real simple reason for that. As they're getting ready for the run, <laughs> they're wearing headphones and they're listening to music. So they don't we don't get to them until we get to the second, you know, till the second run and we're like, "Hey, or on the on the bike course even worse, they're wearing headphones on the on the bike course." Um and oddly odd one, it used to be more prevalent than it trailed off and it's it's coming back into vogue and that is glass containers uh, mm. in transition especially they're they're prohibited uh, and if you bring them into transition it 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 can result in disqualification because it has the potential to ruin the race morning experience for a large number of athletes mm. uh, we had a race uh, here in the Houston area a few years ago where a brand new triathlete first time Never done it before. Was really excited. Brought a six pack of beer and a bottle of champagne in transition. Unfortunately, he forgot while he was fumbling around in the dark and he broke a bunch of glass and we had to move all these athletes out of the way. And you can imagine if you were an athlete and you had just set up your transition area in the dark and now you're wondering whether you're going to step on glass, uh, how pleased you would be. Um, And and then uh, not wearing your race number uh, as as required. Say that one more time. Not wearing your race number as one more required. Time. One more time. Race number as required. Okay. I think they got it. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, we'll often be right outside transition and somebody will go, they put their race belt on and then they have this real long t-shirt that they've, <laughs> they've put on and it's down covering the bib and we can't see it. And we're like, hey, where's your race number? And they're like, hey, right here. I'm like, well, we're not going to be able to see it. So you need to, it needs to be observable. Um a lot of times on, on with the bike, especially, uh, we'll get people that'll say, wait a minute. Um, 
how do I, my, my, my race number, you know, cause everybody is so used to automatically taking it and putting it over a top tube and then it gets all scrunched up. And in many ways that makes it less observable than trimming some of the excess white away and putting it on a down tube, you know, your seat tube. Um, and, and so it's actually more observable, uh, that way. Um, but making sure that we can see it. And then the thing we struggle with uh, in our sport, and I think it's a, it's a common one in many endurance sports, is race number transferring, which is, you know, I, I, I decided to do a race. I signed up for it. I've got my packet, but I don't feel like racing, but I'm going to give my, my son my race number and let him go participate in the race. And the, the reason that's such a big, well, there are many reasons it's a big problem, but from a safety standpoint, if I'm a 70 year old, well, let's say I'm a 60 year old man and I'm letting my 25 year old son race with my number, the medical information available to the paramedics and medical staff is that of a 60 year old man, not a 25 year old man. Right. And so they're going to, and obviously they may make a judgment like this guy isn't 60, you know, in that, but just in general, the medical information is associated with with that number and you and if you're letting somebody else race with your race number and something happens to you and these things do happen in our sport and the medical personnel are trying to figure out what your medical history is instead of the medical history that's on the back of your race number or associated with your race number uh, it could delay the treatment that you need that would be vital to saving your life so there I had you repeat the race number one because the race number one goes a little bit deeper than just you all seeing the number, right? Well, so yeah. timers who are timing, who are paying attention at the finish line need to see it. Announcers who are announcing your name coming across the finish line, if it's not an automated system, need to be able to see. And that's one of the one things that we are constantly you know, telling people, hey, turn your bib around, make sure you turn your bib around. Just turn your bib around, but I get it. So how do you, what type of penalty, if you're caught, does that warrant when you don't have a bib well, or we'll, don't have we'll, your bib rightly it, positioned? Right. Well, if it's not rightly positioned, it's simply, hey, we need to see it. We put it in position. It's a warrant and amend. And if they address it immediately, then we let them keep going. Um, if they say something like, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, or they or they start to argue with you. We'll stop them, and they'll serve a yellow card penalty and in place. Um, but typically, you know, that's a very rare event. It, when we when officials address the athletes, I mean, there's always going to be the, the 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 one or two people who who are there with a, a sense of entitlement uh, that the race is all about them and get, you know, kind of peeved with you. And that's where, once again, that, that remaining calm and just saying, well, sir, or ma'am, we need to see, we need to see the, the number to be able to, to identify you as an athlete in this race that you're, you're on the course and you should be, um, you know, quite often <laughs> it, it, I, I don't think I go to a long course event where there isn't a group of cyclists out there during the bike course and that aren't in the race. And we're like, wait a minute, where there's no numbers. Oh, well, yeah, that person isn't in the race, right. but it's a distraction to what we're trying to do. Um, and, okay. you know, but, but, it, and it's a variable penalty depending on the length of the bike course, right? So it could be anywhere from 10 seconds to, uh, to a minute, you know, uh, depending on the, the, the length of the race. And we, you know, the good thing about the officials family is that, you know, we, we discuss things a lot and we talk about better practices, you know, so even to the extent that where an athlete is subject to disqualification, quite often we use some judgment in how we're uh, in interacting with that athlete to say, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on the demeanor. If they did something that was potentially a disqualifiable offense, they didn't gain any kind of unfair competitive advantage. They're not in danger of knocking somebody off the podium uh, that has qualified for some, you know, world triathlon event or otherwise. Then we can have a discussion with them. And as long as the discussion is is mutually respectful, we can often avoid the disqualification and, and just let it be a learning moment for that athlete. Okay. Now, there's so many... Well, we have a few new rules. Mm -hmm. And if you don't already know the old rules, I suggest you going to USA Triathlon's website and kind of 
downloading the one the 91 page I was gonna say 191 <laughs> but 91 page document that gives you all the rules in a very exhaustive format but what are some of the new rules that we have to look forward to for the 2023 year and I think it's interesting that as a whole world governing body we're trying to move uh the rules so that they're uniform throughout racing whether you're racing on worlds or racing um for the ironman brand or racing a uh, usat sanctioned races can you talk about some of those new rules that will impact racing this year sure so Every national federation that is a member of World Triathlon, USA Triathlon is a, a member of World Triathlon as a national federation. Every national federation has rules that we we like to use the word aligned. They're aligned with World Triathlon. They're not carbon copies necessarily of World Triathlon uh, competition rules. World Triathlon's competition rules really, while they do have age group, uh, non-draft legal uh, rules within their large document, their real emphasis is on draft legal racing and the Olympic movement. And so as we uh, increasingly emphasize draft legal racing here in the United States, it became even more clear that we needed to bring our program into alignment. So for example, uh, USA Triathlon up until um, March 15th of this year at all of our races will feature on-course notification of the penalty and penalty service prior to crossing the finish line. And that's consistent with every other national federation uh, that does the sport of, uh, or does multi-sport, okay? Uh, our system was more punitive than that. So every infraction was treated the same. Whereas if you look at uh, World Triathlon and other national federations, uh, drafting is your blue card. That's your most significant penalty. Every other penalty is much less uh, in terms of a time. Whereas in our old rule set, if you were to race in a USAT 70.3 and were to receive two penalties of any type, doesn't matter, you would have a total of 12 minutes added to your time after the fact. And you would you would find out after you finished your race. So we began looking at that um, in 21 uh, prior to our uh, 2021 age group national championship where we decided that we would go with on course notification for our race and for all those races that weekend and it and it was uh, it was a success for our athletes we increased the length of the draft zone to meet international standards and we went to on course penalty notification and service and once again the athletes really really liked it um and so we did that again at our national championships last year, our own national championships as another experiment, if you will, to see, are we, are we thinking right? Is it, is it really the best way to do this? And we discovered that it was what the athletes wanted. And so with the 2023 rule set, in terms of the on-course notification, that now will be the way we do penalties throughout. Um, our races. And we will work with our race directors to educate on how even the smallest race uh, can still do on-course notification and penalty service. Um, many people have the image of Ironman in the tent, the Ironman penalty tent, and think, well, that's another uh, you know, cost to the race uh, director. They'll have to have a tent. They'll have to have volunteers manning when we know we're all fighting for volunteers. But really, there are many ways that you can do it and what we we have in our education materials is that for example uh, if you're the official at that race and you know you've issued a penalty or two out on the bike course then you know that you need to be at say the aid station at the 5k turnaround to help the athletes serve their yellow or blue card penalty um at, at that point or you could say we'll meet you in ta um and that's where you'll serve and it could even be a volunteer that's already working at the aid station with a clipboard and a, a stopwatch um it's easy to it's a, much easier and frankly it 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 if it's done everywhere else <laughs> at every other national federation for non-draft legal racing i'm not sure why we here in the united states can't also for this uh, ability to 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 do that their penalty service and have a new penalty structure um we in the past um, have never had any prohibition uh, against a bare torso, you know, men running without a shirt mm -hmm. um, at USAT sanctioned events. Um, but in order to seek accreditation with World Triathlon, we had to at least start moving 
in a, in their direction where it is prohibited. Iron Man prohibits it. Uh, World Triathlon prohibits it. And so what we have for 2023 is at USAT national events and World Triathlon qualifying events only, cycling and running with a bare torso is prohibited. And then we kind of moved a little toward the Ironman because we're still trying to get a bunch of new people into draft legal racing, right? Who may not understand all the, the fullness of what the uniform requirements are for world triathlon. And we say athletes must wear a shirt, jersey, or sport top slash sports bra at all times during the run segment of the race and the bike portion of the race. So, okay. um, uh, and that, and then, so then we changed our water temperatures for wetsuit, but we moved very slightly. We didn't move all the way for the sprint and Olympic distance to the water temps uh, that World Triathlon has. We moved to their, like, be in alignment with their longer course temp. And so um, changed our water temperatures for elites to align with World Triathlon. Um, let's see. Uh, we, we In the past, we used to argue that all helmets had to be CPSC standard. Um, we didn't inspect age group helmets, but we tended to inspect elite athletes' helmets on race morning. And so we we did away with that. And we we aligned with the rest of the world and say it needs to be testing authority of, of a national federation that's affiliate of World Triathlon. Okay. So All right, I'm just running through. Oh, uh, we no longer allow snorkels um, in our race. I, this always kind of catches people. They always say, well, I didn't know we ever did. And so USA Triathlon has always allowed snorkels and we moved into alignment with World Triathlon to say snorkels are no longer allowed. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know. That. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's because very race director, people were asking, can I bring my snorkels? And we, yeah. and we were told to say no. Wow, that's interesting. Well, yep. it doesn't matter now because you can't wear them. So, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and uh, you can't use a mirror unless you have a medically verified reason for using a mirror. Mm. We've added multi sport gravel, adaptive triathlon, cross triathlon, cross duathlon, winter triathlon, winter duathlon, draft legal, middle and long distance event rules, and team relay rules, including clarifying uh, the aquathon directives in our rule book. Um, and, and also aqua bike. Um, so let's see. Yeah, the decision was made to to make it a very comprehensive and globally aligned rule book. Uh, the biggest one of the you know kind of from a from a standpoint of inclusion, uh, one of the things that we're really the most excited about is the replacement of the PC Open division mm. with what we call adaptive triathlon. And in a 2024, it'll be adaptive multi-sport. Um, but what it is, is the end result of about 18 months of a large focus group and discussion around how do we widen the door of inclusion for athletes of differing abilities mm. who may not be classifiable as a paratriathlete or, or may not want to be go through classification, formal classification as a paratriathlete who's interested in going to the Olympics or seeing if they can compete at the highest levels of paratriathlon, which has very specific rules. Whereas in adaptive uh, triathlon, what we're trying to do is create more access to a wider range of differences that, uh, that an athlete may be approaching our sport with. For example, we've, we've, we've have, uh, athletes with a genetic condition, such as all a, a lack of uh, sufficient collagen in their in their uh, body. And so they're hyper flexible. They can't sit on an upright bicycle. They can't support themselves. So what are the, what are the equipment choices that they would need to be able to participate in our sport? As long as it's safe to do so on that course. That's why our language in that uh, document is very much written around um, a, a partnership between coaches and athletes and race management to having a discussion of, is this, is this race, does it have the appropriate access uh, to be able to accommodate what a, a particular athlete may need? And so it's a, once again, it's a, a mutual education, right? At the race management becoming more educated, maybe thinking about a different venue uh, or a different layout of their venue for in pre in, for, in, in you know, the next year, 
Um, sometimes, you know, you can't change the race course on the fly because they've been approved by local authorities, but you can use it as an educational point. But what we found was really helpful for race directors was be able through this is to be able to let them know what they can do already instead of them guessing well, because the PC open uh, rules and procedures in previous years was fairly much an open open bucket, you know, so. That's a lot. That's a lot of new stuff that to complement everything else that's happening. And I appreciate how you said globally align. Um, because it does get confusing when you're racing multiple distances in for various brands, um, whether it's worlds, you know, to your local race directors, it does get a little bit of confusing. And so having these greater, these rules kind of sync up in some way, shape or fashion is definitely very helpful. I feel like we covered a lot, but we probably didn't even scratch the surface of a lot of things. <laughs> I want to ask, and I don't know if this is on the officiating side. So in terms of with gender identity and how do athletes um, or how do officials address athletes, how does that work? We don't we don't want our officials to use gender as an identifier when they're writing a penalty up. OK, they're, they're describing the behavior. We want them to use, you know, not athlete number, description of the kit, description of their bike description you know like long pink socks something like that um and and what my goal is uh, in terms of the officials program is to make it look a lot less like me um you know i'm a 60 year old white male um our sport is not all 60 year old white males um and so when i have the opportunity to talk to people at races where we're doing our recruiting outreaches I say the only people that can help us change the face of our officials program are the people that don't look like me and deciding to become officials and and increasing the 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 inclusion of our officiating program because it is the front face of USA Triathlon. The vast majority of our athletes will never interact with anybody on staff at USA Triathlon. They will interact at the local race with an official in a red shirt. And we'd like those officials in the red shirt to start looking more and more like the rest of our our our, our athletes. I love that. I get very excited about this thing. I think it's really, really important. All of these pieces of what yeah. we're doing with the officials program. Um, I'm super proud of the the officials that work in our in our program. You know, um, I, I, I'm always seeking ways to empower them to be the best officials that they can be. I love that. Well, Mark, I feel like we can have endless discussion about rules and the things that um, that affect us as racers, well, as athletes and those who want to race. And so I just encourage you who are listening, take the time to read uh, the race guides that your race directors are putting out. That's their rules on the local level. And then taking it up a step Take some time to, you know, look over the rules book just in general. It is a very healthy document. So maybe get together with some buddies and you guys just kind of split it up and just read it together so that everyone is on the same page. And most importantly, be safe out there this year. Be mindful. Play offense and defense when you're riding on the bike. Be mindful of the cars that are on the road if it's not a closed course. Don't take headphones with you. I know I like the little, the jawbone things that sit on your temple, but that's for training, not for racing. And so thank you so much for coming on, Mark. But we got to, we can't let you go without asking a few questions because that's what we do here. Some, some rapid fire questions. So um, if you can think back to, uh, da, 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 da. Mm, I don't even know how to ask a, an, a, the, the commissioner of officials, what do I ask? So think back, because you're still, um, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm beat. I don't even know how to ask questions, but I can do this. Uh, what, who's your favorite music artist? Oh, gosh, I really like a lot of music artists. Um, I would say now probably Chris Stapleton is at the top of the list, okay. you know, uh, but it, it's a, it's a pretty much a moving target for me. 
Uh, I like all forms of music, and so I have a lot of favorites. I'm, I'm an Adele fan. I'm a, a Journey fan from the old days, the original Journey fan, band. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. When you were racing, what was your favorite distance to race? Oh, Ironman was my favorite okay. distance. Um, I'm, I'm not that fast, so I need a nice long day. I don't mind it. It's like I tell people I don't like running marathons unless it's at the end of an Ironman. Mm -hmm. Ah, facts. And well, what was your favorite leg of the race? Oh, the bike. Okay. It, it, and it's not close. Uh, as you can recall from my first swim, uh, the swim is not my strong suit. I don't like to talk in terms of weakness. I do say it's a limiter for me. Um, yeah. But if I can swim 2.4 miles, and in my case, more like 2.8 by the time I get there, um, it's it's not really a weakness. It's just not my best strong suit. But I, the bike is the, my, my favorite. And if you had chosen a different career outside of triathlon being in a race official, what would it have been? A uh, writer. Um, and so, yeah, I, I love writing. Uh, and so, so what type of genre, what genre would you be writing? Uh, creative writing. And so I was a national council of teachers of English, um, creative writing finalist when I was in high school. So I was the editor of my high school newspaper as a junior and a senior. And, uh, and so I've, I've, whatever I've done, has always involved a lot of writing. I love that. And you know, this is our question that we ask everyone. Do you pee on the bike or take a proper pee break? I take a proper break. Trust me. <laughs> um, yes. That is not a skill I have acquired, nor do I wish to acquire it. <laughs> I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our commissioner of officials, Mark Turner. Thank you so much for, I wish I had one of those applause buttons, like <laughs> in the crowd goes wild. So thank you so much, Mark, for joining uh, with us today. I hope that you guys have an amazing 2023 season. This is just the beginning. Um, you know, we're getting started. You're seeing races pop up. You're seeing people with their metal Mondays. Uh, but this season is for yours to take. But take it smartly. Know the rules. And, of course, we want you to try. Because when you try, you always win. I'm Ashonda Shines, and we're out. Peace. Well, I thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. We need your help so we can continue to try at TBL. So for more information on where you can find and subscribe to this podcast, visit www.trybeginnersluck.com. And don't forget, whenever you try beginner's luck, you always win.